I think in part economists just assume the law without realizing that this is actually what does the thing, right? If you just if you think even of just you know a widget or something that you're trading, right? Um, you know, I think even just go back to the concept of capital. You know, what is capital? Well, you know, it's um, you have capital and labor, two factors of production. Well, but what allows somebody to use some stuff, a machine, input supplies, money, to put this into this particular production process? H how can someone just do this? Well, he has, he has to have the right to do that, right? <laughs> and very often we also see that the capitalist is not a natural person, but it's actually a corporation. So you have to think about, well, what is that? You know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't spring from, spring from nature. It was, it's a legal creature. So that's too, is the law. So I think um, uh, economists are so preoccupied with um, the idea that there are, you know, like typically two actors only, it's very often a binary relationship. And then they sum up the two actors to, to create a market that they get into bargaining with another, but without asking why they can bargain. How can they bargain over this? They must have property rights first before they can bargain. I think even something like, you know, incomplete contract theory, and I know that Nobel Prizes have been given for that, but, but even incomplete contract theory basically says, you know, property rights are the residual of contracts because con contracts are incomplete. And I'm saying, well, you can't even contract without having property rights. Give me a break. You must have th that title, otherwise you can't. I mean, you, um, you can't contract over it. So, so somehow this is, it's, it's puzzling to me. Um, but uh, but it's just a very different logic of thinking about the world. Katerina Pistor is professor of comparative law at Columbia Law School. She thinks and writes extensively about the nature of the law, how to conceptualize the law, and she is one of the leading scholars in this space. Her most recent book is The Code of Capital, How Law Creates Wealth and Inequality. Uh, here, we talk about some of the main ideas from the Code of Capital. We talk about the legal theory of finance. We talk about regulation. We talk about the relationship between capitalism and the law. And we talk about some key ideas in economic theory as they pertain to thinking about the law. Here is my conversation with Katerina Pistor. So maybe just to start off with, uh, how did you get interested in thinking about law? Well, I'm a lawyer by training, um, but I was always a little bored by only playing within the boundaries of the law itself. So I always consider this to be like playing chess. And it's also fun because you can become a really good chess player. But I was always interested in why the figures were making the moves that they were making in a chess game. And what would happen, for example, if you allowed the king to walk around like the queen or if you allowed the horse to make the moves of a of a peasant or vice versa so I, I was always interested in what would happen if you change the rules of the game and that basically requires a different perspective on the law it's not like a lawyer who is trying to you know use the law for you know advancing the interest of a client or solving a case it's basically playing chess but it's asking, you know, why does the game work the way it does? And why do some societies play chess and others might play Go or something else, right? So that's, these are the questions I was really interested in. So I, was, I always looked a little bit outside the law, even as I studied it uh, in my early days. So when you came about the scene, was there a prevailing view of how people conceptualized the law? So I should um, add to this, I studied law in Germany, uh, which means that I, I was exposed to a highly doctrinal scientific kind of philological interpretation of the law. So this is, the tra tradition is here theology <laughs> more than anything else. And it's it's just making your way through really complex doctrine where law professors in particular advance their own views on the law. And in Germany and many other civil law jurisdictions, very often the courts refer to what the professors do and say. Uh, the professors write commentaries on the law that courts consult. And so the interpenetration of what the academy does and what courts do is it's to some extent greater than in, in a common law jurisdiction. So so in, um, in in Germany, we were you know very much told that you know this is the law here. you get your civil code, you get your commercial code, and then you'll learn how to interpret and apply it. And the perspective in civil law jurisdictions is the one of a judge. So we are all trained to be judges essentially. Um, and only after we have, have qualified to become judges, can we also become attorneys? In the common law systems, the other way around, uh, students and uh, are, are trained to become 
lawyers, attorneys, and then they practice for decades, and only after that they might become a judge. So it's a very top-down thinking, it's, um, it, and, and it's also very um, deductive, so you have the big legal trend principles, and from there you have to deduce what the rules are, and within some room you know, of man to maneuver within, within some flexibility of interpretation, but that's basically the, the system that I studied for years and years, yeah. So then you got to thinking about how the law is treated in economic theory. Correct. Um, so the first thing I did basically to free myself from the constraints of German law think <laughs> was to do a Master of Laws in London uh, in 88, 89, and I studied um, Chinese law and Soviet law. So I wanted to do something completely different. And I, I was interested in, in, in Chinese law. That's why I went to London to the School of Oriental and African Studies there, because in the 1980s, many Chinese legal scholars had come to Germany to study German law. And the reason being that before the, the revolution in China and the communist takeover, etc., um, China had turned to German-style civil law because they had looked to Japan. And Japan had adopted German law. And so after they started to rebuild their legal systems, which they had pretty, pretty much gutted, China had gutted um, in the Great Leap Forward in the 50s and then in the Cultural Revolution in the late 1970s, early 80s, they were thinking about rebuilding the, the legal system. So they came to Germany. And I thought this was really very puzzling because I had read enough about China that I thought it's a really, really, really different country from Germany. So what are they going to do with our laws, right? And so that these kind of questions, of course, open your perspective to think very differently about the law. So I thought I'm just going to go and get out of German law for a while and study Chinese law. And when I was in London, my supervisor, my mentor suggested I should also study Soviet law. So in 88, 89, in this fateful year, I studied, you know, the the legacy of socialist law, essentially. And then in June 89, while I was writing my exams, uh, Tiananmen Square happened in China. And when I returned to Germany in the fall of 89, the wall fell and the entire Eastern Bloc opened up, um, which then prompted me to uh, study um, uh, the transformation of the former socialist world. And that was my that was my entry really to uh, towards economics and the economic analysis of law, but 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 informed by uh, by institutional change on the ground. So my, my, my path to this was less theoretical, although I was looking for theory to explain what's going on because, because clearly a German legal system that takes the law as is and doesn't look beyond the law has no way of explaining or even analyzing what is happening in a country like Russia, for example, or Czech Republic, or East, even Eastern Germany at the time of this transformation. So that I was basically looking to neighboring disciplines, to, to economics in particular, but also to sociology, economic sociology, to, to tr try to understand what was going on and how to think about the law in this context. Right. It's very interesting because uh, most people who think about conceptual foundations and economics generally come from a top-down perspective. They come from philosophy, or think about economic theory, but you, you, you come from both the, the high-level perspective and from a practitioner's perspective in both. Correct. Yeah. So, so I mean, I, I this, you know, I, I remember when I was writing a, a, my my master thesis in London, I was I was uh, writing about um, the collective, the reform of the collectives in Russia in comparison to China, and um, you know, what do you do with 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 property doctrine? You know, you just you can't you can't explain any of that. So I, I was looking then in economic theory for how people thought about property rights, what they were. And of course, that you know that led me then to property rights theory and neoclassical economics and that stuff, also to some of the more sociological accounts. And uh, uh, But it's, you know, it's always, I, I mean, I think my view on the world has always been inflected about what, what is happening and, and, and inflected by a very comparative perspective that also teaches you actually there's not one way to think about the law or apply the law, and there's certainly not one way to think about economics either. And I think that also has helped me keep a little bit of a distance to uh, the standard law and economics approach because you don't l learn it as a doctrine if you do, you know, if you basically search for explanations for something you try to explain on the ground, but you're just sort of testing different types of theories against each other as you're trying to explain the world. Right. So just to take a simple starting point, um, like you laid out, uh, of how people think in economic theory, so there's there's the rational actor model and there's more socially embedded actor model um, do you find either more satisfactory uh, and in line with how you conceptualize the law, or do you find that both are missing out in important ways? Well, I think in the end, they, they both miss out. So you're referring to uh, basically an, an analytical framework that I built for um, rethinking the world of finance after the 2008 crisis. 
So I had actually worked until the, the 2008 crisis, the great crisis of capitalism and financial capitalism. I had worked mostly on the former socialist world and emerging markets. And then, of course, I felt, you know, maybe there is a transformation of capitalism underway and sh I should better uh, take a closer look at that. And um, the way I approached the study of the financial system was to, first of all, um, simply concede that there were no good theories about the financial system that we had just observed almost collapsing because none of the theories had predicted the collapse. Um, obviously, the timing you can't ever predict in complex systems, but they had, hadn't even bothered to theorize about um, the collapse, not, not the standard theories. There are others, of course. And so I felt it was time to reconsider the theoretical frameworks that were used for explaining our financial system domestically and globally. And so I designed a project in what I think most people might believe to be a kind of counterintuitive fashion by basically saying, if we look at the most dominant theoretical frameworks, neoclassical economics, if you want, that's the rational active framework. And But there's also a, a parallel development in sociology, economic in sociology that takes a very different stand, but is also kind of, um, you know, has certain priors that different sociologists share, such as um Actors are socially embedded, everything is contextualized, blah, 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 right? So, so I just said, okay, not, neither framework was really, really useful in trying to deal with the financial system that we currently have. So again, like before with the social system and the transformation there, I just thought, okay, so where do we find explanations that make more sense? So I put, to, put together a research team, of uh, a, an interdisciplinary team, and said, okay, let's take a close look at different segments of the financial market and explain why they collapsed. And explain not only why they collapsed, but explain why the theories that we typically use did not explain why they collapsed. Right? So like a meta-level analysis. Why do the th theoretical framework that we use, when do they break down? When do they break down? And why do they break down? And so each team basically had to, first of all, internalize how I had conceptualized the rational actor framework versus the embedded actor framework. And then they had to go out and find empirical evidence, present a case study basically, and do what I like to call an institutional autopsy, really carefully dissect this segment of the market, whether it's consumer credit, you know, securitization, um, whether it's sovereign debt or, or money, um, and then explain what what the dominant theories missed. And so these two, these frameworks, this framing of rational actor and embedded actors actually um, were helpful to bring the group together and explain what we needed to do, but we dropped this framework very quickly, both because we felt there's something else going on. So we delved really into the institutional structures and the organization of these markets, um, which is kind of more contextual, if you like, than most neoclassical approaches uh, would have it. But it wasn't also in the way that most sociologists would understand sort of the, the concept textualization and embeddedness, because global financial markets are not deeply embedded in society. They're very abstract. And they, they work, I think, through the law, which is why... I ended up then writing the lead paper for a special issue where we published our results, um, and I called it a legal theory of finance, right? Um, and so, so this is again, it's a maybe my typical roundabout way to try to get at uh, new theoretical insights by testing existing ones against empirics um, that may or may not align with it, and if they don't align, then you have to find new theoretical foundations, and that was the search for them. Right, when one gets upset with the rational actor model, it's so easy to give into context and not admit to some of the conceptual shortcomings there as well. Correct. It's it's just such an it's such a, such an intuitively easy theoretical model. I think Amatya Sen at one conference I attended, he said it's just like the utilitarian mode of the 15 year old. Everybody understands it. Everybody can use it. You can build nice little models around this. this you can calculate everything. But it's just simply wrong, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so oh, it's, it's not very really helpful. I mean, it's, it's it, it, you know it's right in some very limited sense, but it doesn't help you to understand a system. Right. So, just for the audience, would you mind describing what the legal theory of finance is? So, the legal theory of finance basically asserts that the financial system is a legal construct, right? So, every IOU, every claim to future payment, is. Um, a legally protected claim, and if it wasn't legally protected, it wouldn't really work. So we can, of course, have financial relations in, in closed social settings where we know each other and can monitor each other, and where we have some social norms that are enforced through some social hierarchies, whatever it is. So that, that, that does work, 
But we're talking today about a global financial system, even a national financial system is too complex um, and too anonymous to rely on social norms alone. So in order to convince somebody to give you money for a piece of paper, <laughs> money too, of course, is not even a piece of paper, it's just an entry in some account, to exchange something of value for a commitment to repay or to make some regular payments of something, you have to assure the other party that there's some reason why this is credible. So it's not just social norms that work. It has to be something else. And I'm basically arguing what, what, what that other thing is, is law and law enforcement or the enforceability of, of commitments that people make. So I'm basically saying every IOU, and that's just nothing new, right? every IOU is a legally enforceable contract. If it wasn't legally enforceable, it wouldn't work. This is also why so much um, money is spent on lawyers who are devising and designing new types of financial instruments that work notwithstanding all the amount of regulation that has been put in place in different jurisdictions around the world. So as uh, a practicing lawyer with whom I sometimes teach tells my students always, you have to think about all these regulations as the scaffolding around a building. And if you are a good lawyer, what you're trying to do is to design a new financial instrument that fits through the gaps of that scaffolding mm -hmm. such that it's compliant with the formal law, but it doesn't have maybe the cost <laughs> that full compliance with the spirit of the law would entail as well. So that's that's basically the line that you're trying to thread here. Um, so the, the legal theory of finance basically says, first, all, all financial commitments are legal commitments. They have to be enforceable, either, otherwise they don't work. That also means that our financial system is not just private, it is necessarily imbued with public power because otherwise it wouldn't work. And it's not only imbued with legal power, it's also imbued with money. And money itself is also a product of the state because there is a difference between an IOU that I issue as a private person or corporation issues or an IOU that the U.S. government issues because the U.S. government is capable of standing in for the nominal value of its money um, and I'm not. It will be determined by, by, by the market. In international context, the value of the U.S. dollar will, will also be determined by the market, but the government has a lot of power to intervene um, and, 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 and uh, help influence these prices. Anyway, so I'm basically saying, first, legally constructed. Second, it's essentially, or the system that we have is hybridic. Maybe it doesn't have to be hybridic, but currently is hybridic. It's both state and market, public and private. The third um, uh, parameter of this of this financial um, uh, system that we have is um, what I call the law and finance paradox, which means that we need the law to scale financial system to size, because without law and enforceability, we couldn't have anonymous markets of the size and complexity that we do. But here's the catch. Whenever there is um, uh, somebody catches a cold in the system and doesn't pay the debt that is owed, there can be, um, uh, most people will try to enforce their current rights against their counterparties because they get cold feet. They have to think at that moment, are my rights as good as I think they are? And if they have some doubts, they will probably say, well, l let me either try to sell them now or let me force the debtor to pay and to, to, you know, to realize my rights now. If everyone in the system tries to realize their rights at the same time, the system must crash. It's just that's the definition of, of course, fractional reserve um, uh, banking is the definition of any credit-based finance. Nobody has enough cash to pay back applications immediately. Most people roll over their debt um, time and again. And so the system crashes because the law creates the illusion that my clients are actually enforceable, where in fact they can't be realized. I might be able to enforce, I might find an insolvent debtor. The fear of finding an insolvent debtor prompts everybody to enforce a little faster. And so everybody's running on assets and trying to enforce them. It's a, it's basically part of the legal structure. You have a right to get it. So get it now before others might get it. That's, that's sort of the idea. And so the construction of a global complex financial system in law also means that the law itself can bring down the entire system. And from that predicament, we can be saved only if somebody like a powerful central bank says, okay, surprise, surprise, we will suspend some of the rules of the game, right? We're making the law more elastic than it truly is, and we're making the law more elastic at some levels than at others. And typically what the um, central banks or treasury, whoever intervenes, do is that they make the law more elastic at the apex of the system to protect the system as such. 
So you and I are not so important. We can be evicted from our houses, but you can't allow the big banks to fail. They tried it with Lehman, and the repercussions were such that within 48 hours, they bailed out AIG, right? And we see now with Silicon Valley Bank that the Treasury stands there and says, whenever there is something that could look like contagion and might bring out about a financial system, we will immediately suspend or relax the rules of the game. In this case now, basically the deposit insurance um, rules. So that may, may, means basically we have a system that is coded in law. It can collapse by when the law is really enforced as written. And you can get out of this only if you suspend the law, which basically undermines the credibility of the law that you need to create the system from the get-go, right? So there's a, so that's, a, that's, that's sort of the paradoxical roundabout. And then by simply observing what central banks tend to do in situations like that, I'm basically saying the law is actually more elastic than we often think it is, and um, central banks in particular make it elastic. Sometimes private parties do this too. They renegotiate deals. Um, and if you talk to private lawyers in the run-up to the 2008 September peak of the crisis, they did a lot of things that were not written in the contracts, but tried to negotiate around these contracts so to uh, prevent the kind of the, the meltdown. So law is not always just as rigid. It's important to have the illusion of its rigidity because that creates the credibility we want to have for financial markets. But law can also be suspended and very often is either by the parties themselves or typically the one with a greater bargaining power or by a central bank. So, so just to stress this, how do you imagine that regulation works from a legal theory of finance perspective? So uh, it's, it's a good good point. So regulation, that's kind of the scaffolding, right, um, that we have to know and we have to see how we can get around it or find the gaps within the regulation to make sure that we can do what we what we want to do without making it illegal. So regulation typically um, comes in big waves in financial crisis. That's when the legislature is galvanized and they have to do something to assure the public that something is going to be done. Regulation is always takes very often public form. So you have a Securities and Exchange Commission, you know, that enforces new rules or the CFTC or the banking regulators, whoever is charged with that. But it's typically that some kind of a public agent has to take a law and then, you know, interpret what the what the definitions in this law really mean, and then has to go after the private actors that might be in violation, or create screening mechanisms to ensure that only actors that comply with the rules or only instruments that comply might be might might be um, allowed to be circulated or traded by some intermediaries. So 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 that's the setup. Now what what. Um, Private attorneys will do um, to help their clients deal with regulations that can be quite costly and can restrict them in their actions is to use the private law, use contracts and property law and collateral law and corporate law and bankruptcy law to code around it. Right? That's sort of the language I use in the code of capital, the coding idea um, that you um, that you pretend to be compliant. You have to know exactly where the hard line is, but you're trying to find ways to to uh, what lawyers sometimes say to mute the effects of public regulation. So I think public regulations are important stopgap measures to get the system somehow into a more, um, I don't want to say normal state, but a more quiet state. But it's only a matter of time, tip typically for um, well, well legally advised financial clients to get around these public law restrictions again. Right. So from, so from there, are you thinking about the normative principles behind regulation and how they could possibly be altered or or is that sort of like the wrong level of analysis um, to, or inefficient given how embedded the system is so i'm actually currently writing on a book project where i ask precisely this question i'm basically saying asking the question how is it that a system that is coded in law capitalism as i argue in the code of capital is so resilient to legal regulation or legal governance right so you have World War II, the entire system collapses. We had a financial crisis before that that is partly responsible for what happened afterwards. We have the New Deal in the United States. We, we sort of create a system both domestically and globally with the IMF, Bretton Woods, da 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 to try to cabin capitalism. How long does it last? Two to three decades at most. Right? That's when we basically get off the gold standards. We already have you know swap lines that between banks to get around capital controls. We have all kinds of stuff that erodes already in the 50s, 60s, by 70s, we're out of it. By the 80s, 90s, we have global capitalism rolling again, right? 
So that we have to explain. And 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 so I'm, I'm basically saying, so there, there are important mechanisms in private law that allows private actors to always get around it. One is that the private law really empowers private actors, right? It, it does give them legally protective power and they know how to use it. And it empowers not only individuals, but corporations. The second is that private actors also have access to the means of coercion. You know, we, we often, often say the state has centralized the means of coercion, so it's all state. But litigation is one way to access the you know centralized means of coercion in a highly decentralized fashion. And knowing how to do this and having the right tools available to do this helps private parties to get their way both against other private parties and against the state. You sue the state for over-regulating, right? And you've seen this also after the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, a couple of companies, um, insurance companies, sued the state for being uh, um, uh, designated as systematically important financial intermediaries, right? So then you get around this. You use the legal system to protect your own interest. And then last but not least, what I call legal arbitrage, which is the ability to interpret and reinterpret and repurpose the law, um, allows you to to do this in a big way, especially if you have um, um, good lawyers. So these mechanisms mean that any kind of regulation will always be um, only uh, relatively effective and usually only temporarily effective until they find another way to get around it. So my take on this is that we can't only rely on that. It's just not enough. And also the you know, the time it takes to get regulation passed almost increases because of the divisiveness of our politics. But the sophistication of lawyers to get around has increased too. So we're, we're playing this, you know, um, uh, this catch-up game, this uh, cat and mouse game in a way that is not really beneficial for society at large. And so I think we have to go deeper and, 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 and think about the coding itself. And we have to also get the private law straightened out and not treat this as like the holy cow that we don't touch and we just patch up the system once in a while with a bit of public regulation. Right. right. Okay. So just to step back uh, from a legal theory of finance to the code of capital, would you just mind outlining how that transition worked? Yeah, I think, you know, after after this paper was published in the legal theory of finance and, you know, and especially with all the case studies that my colleagues had done, we actually you know, had seen that how specific types of legal institutions and devices are used in finance, right? Especially when you think about securitization and derivatives and the special purpose vehicles and all these fancy stuff for which we have these jargon style names. When you look at the underlying legal structure, what you see is a good old contract, some property rights, some collateral trust, common law trust, a corporate entity and some, and some bankruptcy law very often um, changed and amended after a lot of lobbying from the financial industry to change the bankruptcy rules and create safe harbors, stuff like that. So you look at these, I just look at these tools, at these devices, like, you know, you just open the toolbox and you just look at all this and said, oh, you know, that's nothing new. <laughs> it just has been employed now in finance in a particular way. So I just started looking into the history of these institutions. Where did the trust come from? What did it do in the past? You know, how was the corporation invented? How were property rights? Who creates property rights? You know, this is truly the state, and can others create property rights too? And so I did a lot of this historical research, and at some point it struck me that all these institutions, with the partial exception of bankruptcy law, came relatively late, only the 18th century. But all of these other institutions can be traced back to feudal times. They've been with us for quite some time, right? So private law precedes our democratic development. Right? It was embraced by democracy, it was embraced by our constitutional system and sanctioned by them, but it actually comes from a very different era. And you know, so, 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 so that, that was the bridge for the Code of Capital, because I thought, okay, now let's, let's just write a book and explain to people how these institutions have been used time and again to create certain you know, privileges in wealth and power for some. Um, but not for others. So you have to have access to the right lawyers. You have to have resources. You might also have to have some social standing to be able to make your case in court. And and so that led me then to write the Code of Capital. So from there, you you outlined the, the principles of priority, durability, convertibility, universality as the key components that are entailed to to convert a natural asset into a monetized asset, uh, into a capital asset. Uh, would you mind describing how, how that works? Yes. So just in terms of methodology, you can see my mind working exactly as I described it earlier with, you know, discovering the social system or developing the legal theory of finance. I'm basically 
looking at you know at, at the historical development or the the transformation that we see right now and i'm trying to see how we can explain it and i'm also trying to see how lawyers have thought about you now these institutions like trust property rights and contracts and 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 then i'm looking at how it's actually being applied in the crisis and what the effects of these devices have been in the crisis and basically you know the code of capital does a kind of reverse engineer and saying how does it how did this happen before so I look at all these institutions and then I, of course, have to ask myself, what exactly is did they do in order to advance the interests of capital? What 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 is capital? Then comes, becomes the question. So, of course, as you know, there others had, you know, had started to do new research on capital as well. Uh, Thomas Piketty had just published his first the French version and in 2014, the English version of his capital in the 21st century. And um, so he starts with a relatively simple definition of, of capital, which I find maybe incomplete but useful as a starting point, um, which is to say that um, uh, capital is an asset that has the capacity to generate and protect wealth. But then the question is, how does it do that? You know, how, how, how does capital do this? And it's, it, you know, in, in my mind, it's just not only supply and demand because there's something special here. I mean, capital is privileged in so many different ways. So. I basically, um, looking at these legal institutions that have been used to protect certain positions that are quintessentially capitalist, which is on control over the means of production, controlling financial instruments, right? Um, uh, in financial capitalism, so you, you can you can look at sort of the the legal structures that underpin the economic positions that we loosely define as capital. And I basically made just the next step and said, capital is coded in law, and what the law does, it confers certain types of attributes on stuff, on simple things that turn it into capital. So I'm basically saying, give me any object, any promise to future payment or any idea. Um, we can add the social relations on digital media, et cetera. I didn't talk about this in the in the book, but but give me any, any asset. I just use this as a ge generic term. And with the right legal coding, I can flip it into a, um, a capital asset because what the coding does, if it's done well, is it ensures that the holder of this asset has priority, right? That's ranking, ranking claims against each other. So if you have the stronger right, you always win. You always have to code your stuff in a way that you have a high probability of being recognized as the strongest, strongest rights holder, right? Priority is key. Second, um, much less often discussed, but at least equally important is durability which means I have to protect my assets from losing value or from attacks by competing claimants. And these attacks can very, come very often from creditors, private creditors or public creditors. So the tax authorities, they want to have 20 or 30 or even more percent of what I have. So I've got to protect my stuff from them, otherwise I don't have it. Creditors also may want to have more than I want, I'm want. i willing to give them. So how can I protect myself from liability to, towards contractual creditors, but also toward creditors? Um, that's what the corporation does and trusts do. They basically create legal yields around pools of assets and protect them from too many creditors, right? That's, that's what durability creates. Um, then the third is um, convertibility. And convertibility is how financial assets attain um, durability. So financial assets are always being traded, so you don't want to lock them in behind a wheel, but you nonetheless want to protect their values. How do you do this? You basically have to find a way to make sure that whenever your financial assets that you hold are in danger of losing too much value, you can flip them into something that is face safer. You can basically sell them for cash. Why do you want to have cash? Because the state protects the nominal value of money. It might lose its real value in times of inflation. So that's an issue. But in times of in a financial crisis, when everything is losing value and you can see it daily, right? Having a nominal value protection is actually w worth a lot. So convertibility into cash becomes key. And of course, private actors negotiate for this in private contracts. They want to have, um, they want to have either um, uh, credit lines to somebody else. They want to have, be able to have a put option. They want to have contracts with others that will roll over that their debt so they have cash to to reinvest or pay off their other liabilities. So you see this in private contracts, and of course you see this with banks and their relationship to central banks because they always get some liquidity buffer. They have to access to the reserves or they have access to the discount window or however we structure this. 
So that's key. So convertibility, which basically is not just trading, it's not just assigning your rights, but it's the ability to get something safer, ultimately cash, ultimately the US dollar is convertibility. And then last but not least, in order to make the system really work, you have to ensure that these different positions are enforceable, not a, not only between two parties to a, of a contract, but against the world. Anybody who trespasses on my property, I can tell them not to, unless they have a special right, right? I can call in the police, I can call in the bailiffs. If I have a legal veal that, that protects my corporation, then nobody can get through that veal, right? And neither the shareholders nor the creditors, I will protect it, and I can use the courts to do so. That's what universality does. So these four attributes, priority, durability, convertibility, universality, are critical attributes for um, flipping ordinary stuff, a piece of land, a promise, an idea into a capital asset that actually generates wealth, monetary types of wealth, and 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 uh, and protects it over time. Right. And, and from there, you show that given the toolkit of legal modules, you could take any asset and code it to have these attributes. Exactly. That that is a condition, but I think that condition has been produced by by legal evolution in tandem with the evolution of capitalism. Um, during this period, the definition of different legal categories um, has become ever more abstract. Um, so, you know, what is a property or what is a collateral? We used to have like a, a gazillion different types of collateral and each had a different name and applied only to a particular thing. You had a particular collateral in a cow or in another collateral into a machine, like another collateral in a land, etc. But once you standardize, this becomes very general, general, generalized and very generic, then you can actually apply it to almost anything you want. So this is another, you know, another interesting insight that I had at the, when I, when I, I you know, looked beyond the legal theory of finance and and just looked at the institutions that were commonly used to create these attributes for capital, which is property rights, collateral law, which is a form of property law, um, corporate law and the common law trust, bankruptcy law and and contract law. They come up time and again, always the same stuff in slightly varied form. And and I found this just striking the continuity of the legal institutions given the enormous transformation of capitalism itself during that period. So from there, the thesis emerges that the law plays a very central role in the propagation of our economic system, capitalism. Uh, and that's a revision of how things are traditionally thought of in economics. Yes, no, I think, you know, I think economists have learned over the last couple of decades that institutions matter. Um, you know, classic economics was thinking about a firm only of a, as a production function. So they learned that there's something more to it. Um, I think the, the you know the, the standard theories of the firm and economics are still lacking behind what we see in reality, but they are also necessarily kind of abstractions from it. But yes, I'm I'm basically saying um, it is it is the, the the law that codes capital and creates wealth and inequality in a very fundamental way. It's of course not completely deterministic. It also takes actors who use law in a particular way. It takes a political a climate that makes it possible to use the law in a particular way. But without the um, the power that law and le power and legitimacy and authority that the law confers, um, the asset holders would have a much harder time. To do this. And they're basically taking a social resource, which is the legitimacy and authority of a legal system, to claim time and again, again, um, this is legal what we're doing. Uh, if you just go back, you know, to the publication of the Paradise Papers, the latest, you know, tax evasion disclosure that investigative journalists have given us and you know the financial times just wrote you know what's what's the problem with blair and others it's legal what they did it's legal <laughs> so um you just have to make sure it's legal and then the question is who can do this for you and who has access to the right lawyers to make it legal or make it appear to be legal and who does not right so so just throw this out then then traditionally, does economics imagine law to play a more external role in the development of that, in the development of capitalist systems, whereas the way that you're imagining it, it seems to play a more generative role in the in the evolution of, of a capitalist system. Yes, I think that's one way to one way of putting it. I think um, uh, I think in part economists just assume the law without realizing that this is actually what does the thing, right? If you just if you think even of just you know, a widget or something that you're trading, right? Um, you know, I think even just go back to the concept of capital. You know, what is capital? Well, you know, it's um, you have capital and labor, two factors of production. Well, but what allows somebody to use some stuff, a machine, input supplies, 
money to put this into this particular production process. H how can someone just do this? Well, he has he has to have the right to do that, right? <laughs> and very often we also see that the capitalist is not a natural person, but it's actually a corporation. So you have to think about well, what is that? You know, it's not it's not it doesn't spring from spring from nature. It was it's a legal creature. So that's too is the law. So I think. Um, uh, Economists are so preoccupied with um, the idea that there are, you know, like typically two actors only. It's very often a binary relationship, and then they sum up the two actors to to create a market that engage into bargaining with another, but without asking why they can bargain. How can they bargain over this? They must have property rights first before they can bargain. I think even something like you know incomplete contract theory, and I know that Nobel prizes have been given for that, but, but even incomplete contract theory basically says, you know, property rights are the residual of contracts because con contracts are incomplete. And I'm saying, well, you can't even contract without having property rights. Give me a break. You must have th that title, otherwise you can't. I mean, you, um, you can't contract over it. So, so somehow this is, it's, it's puzzling to me. Um, but, uh, but it's just a very different logic of thinking about the world. Right. It's a, it's a tricky point to understand because, like, like you say, people just take it as an assumption. It's a given that law occurs, but, but once you see it, you, 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 can't, you can't not see it anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I think once you, I mean, I'm, of course, obsessed, but I'm, I'm hoping others become as obsessed as I am now. Yes. You've, you've converted me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so from this then, and, and I know you make this argument or, or pose this question, um, does the question emerge that does law have a, a, an inherently capitalist component to it? So that's that's also a really interesting question and one that I'm tackling in this new book project, right? Um, and I went back and read some of the you know socialist legal theorists that I studied when I was studying Soviet law in the, in the late 1980s. Uh, one of them being Yevgeny Pashukhanis, um, a Soviet, the first major Soviet legal theorist, who was actually liquidated by Stalin uh, later on. But but his position was that all law is necessarily capitalist. And I, I think that's an extreme position. But he argued this, of course, from a Marxist position, which said that under communism, both the state and the law would wither away because all would basically live according to their needs and make the contributions that they could to society and that sort of the power structures of a state and the legal system would dissolve under communism. Now, we've never reached that stage. And I also think it's naive to believe that that stage is within reach for complex societies. So I think we always have will have power structures, and we always have to think about how to organize violence, and how to institutionalize and um, and it, which means both how to cabin it, but also how to grant access to the sources of violence in different ways. So I think whatever you want to call it, right, is there's always going to be some kind of a structure of that sort if you want to have a peaceful um, uh, society. But but there is a position that says all laws necessarily capitalist. Once I move away from that, I have to ask myself what makes this particular legal system capitalist, because I think that's what it is. And again, this is not a question that is very often asked. I mean, in the comparative law li li literature, people distinguish between the common law and the civil law. Um, they had included the socialist law at some point, but it didn't draw the conclusion that if that is socialist, maybe ours is capitalist. <laughs> Uh, there is the, new, the the law and finance literature that you might be familiar with from the 1990s, um, Andre Schleifer and his co-authors um, uh, talking about law and finance and basically saying, you know, law is all about, about protecting investor rights and, and getting better returns and, and, and that's sort of the helping hand that the legal system gives the financial system. That's a very, I think, very capitalist way of thinking about the law. So I think there's some truth to it. And understanding capitalist law as a law that is um, uh, geared towards empowering private actors to both create wealth and protect their wealth against others and uh, and 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 so so I think you know you can one can identify certain characteristics as as, as quintessential capitalism and one one is and here I'm back with Pashu Khan who said the division between public and private law is a critical feature of capitalist law and the assumption that private law operates in a different realm where the public should not interfere so much, even though the public offers its enforcement apparatuses. So creating these zones of freedom, um, but not only of freedom, also of empowerment, because at the same time we say not only you can do whatever you want, you can also say actually, and if you have the right rights, you can employ our means of coercion to enforce them, right? That's sort of the add-on 
that is critical for for the the, the capitalist system. Um, so I'm basically I'm, I'm back to you know what I said earlier. I'm I'm saying these 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 three mechanisms of you know law is empowerment for private actors, access decentralized access to the centralized means of coercion and legal arbitrage are important features of capitalist um, law. What do you make of Bajikanis' idea? Well, as I said, I, I don't agree with that because I think um, this idea that there could be something like commun communism without a state in the law is naive and um, and I don't buy into that. And it's it's also danger, dangerous because it does empower some people to claim that what they that they have the truth and they don't even need a state in the law to justify what they're doing and you know tragically Pashukhanis you know was killed by Stalin because he cont continued to insist that there shouldn't be a state and legal system on the path to communism and Stalin was of course doing exactly the opposite and and Pashukhanis in his own thinking didn't have a way to defend himself because he had called all individual rights protections like fetishes of a capitalist legal order right and if you don't have these kind of legal protections, you're completely exposed to the powers that be who will also use the legal system against you if they have to, or if or simply brute power, they just shoot you. Right. So so it seems like there isn't really robust theorizing about this on the socialist side either. No, there's not that much. I mean, Pasha Khanis, of course, was early. There are later, um, uh, you know, progressive thinkers who have um, thought about this on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, you know, in, in the U.S., you find somebody, somebody like Robert Hale, who... Um, Book, wrote a book, Freedom Through Law, in the 1950s, and he has this interesting statement where he says, private, private law allows some actors to do to others what no state would be allowed to do to them, which I think is a very insightful statement. It tells you just the extent to which law creates power that is non-accountable. You know, we always try to make the state accountable to all kinds of things, and with more or less success, and and I do think that some liberal theorists like uh, Edith Sklar or so are correct in saying that the state has the control also over terror and war. It has the, it still has the, you know, most, um, most control rights over coercion in whatever form. And yet, we shouldn't downplay private power, right? So we have to come to terms with that. That the legal system does empower private that are not subject to accountability. We always say it's the market, competition, some other mechanisms that will tame private power. And the truth is. That's not enough. Otherwise, we wouldn't live in the system that um, uh, that we have. So, so there are there's, uh, people like Robert Hale. There are also um, people like um, the the Greek Marxist, and he was a lawyer, which I also like because not not many of the, the Marxist scholars are also lawyers. Um, Nikos um, Polanzas, he he wrote an interesting book in the late 1970s about the relation economy, state, and and the law and and uh, was thinking about um, uh, how to conceptualize a state and not just arguing it's withering away. So he just moved away from the Marxist position. We don't need to think about this. But he wanted to critique the socialist state, but he also, of course, critiqued the capitalist state and its legal system. Right. It, it just seems weird that Marx, who was a lawyer himself, didn't think too much about this or didn't write too much about this. Um, or maybe he did, and it just never got finished, which is always the trouble with reading works. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. I uh, that's yeah. I've I've asked myself that question too. I mean, he does have a lot of really good insights about the law, and I think sometimes in his shorter um, articles he gets really deep into this. I you know in the Code of Capital I have a reference to some of the pieces he wrote for, I think the New York Herald or some outlet, where he analyzes the the Bank of France and the debt structures and share structures. He he, he was. He, he was a good lawyer. He could, he could look through these structures. But somehow, I think in his theorizing, he, he left um, behind sort of the minute institutions and went more into like a grand scale theorizing. Um, that, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I think we're, you know, there's lots, there's lots of comments he makes throughout his works about the state and the law, but it doesn't really come together to a coherent whole. Right, right, right. So, so from there, the those three characteristics of law, the, uh, the stress on individual rights, decentralized access to centralized means of coercion and, and legal arbitrage. Uh, do you, are, are you imagining uh, frameworks for how those could be changed? I, I know you talk about how legal arbitrage is, is, is chiefly uh, amenable to change, but the others at least, are you thinking about ways that that could be altered, that could be more approachable? So, 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 yes, I mean, legal arbitrage is difficult to tame because, you know, law is inherently incomplete, which I also argued in, in some of my work earlier. 
I think there's still some room for um, uh, dealing with this in the sense that we shouldn't just buy into this um, hugely formalistic legal arbitrage positions that many lawyers take. Right? So most law laws also have a purpose and have an underlying normative goal. And, um, and it would be possible if we wanted to, to say actually certain, you know, and, and, and you have court rulings, you know, I did, do teach U.S. corporate law. You have court rulings where courts say not everything that is permissible under the law is necessarily legal or equitable. And we will tame it, right? So, so, so if you take that position and you say, actually, no, you can't just do everything that you just can fit within this wording of the law, but there is an underlying normative purpose, then I think we could tame one of the most, some of the most extreme forms of legal arbitrage. So even there, there's room for change. Uh, the question is how to make sure that this happens and, and, and stays like that and doesn't sort of, you know, you don't have the slippery slope back into, you know, powerful actors telling courts how you could, you know, milk the legal system to the very extreme. So but that, you know, it's, it's possible, but it's, of course, never resolvable completely because law is inherently incomplete. The other two is, I mean, private empowerment. So I think I should say, um, and I'm sometimes being accused for that of, of being a liberal, or maybe I'm a liberal. I, I do think that markets are a good idea. I also do think that, you know, um, the ability to exchange with others without centralized control and central planning is a good idea. I think I studied socialism for long enough to think that the particular way in which socialism was organized under the Soviet system was really, really not a good idea. So I'm, I'm not going there. But I think that doesn't exclude the possibility of finding a different type of system, right? So it's not just a binary. We have many more options. And so we have to think about those. So I think um, uh, um, in order for private parties to be able to sort out their affairs with one another, we need something like, you know, titles, rights, claims, remedies. But we can take a closer look at our legal systems and, and thinking about actually who has these rights, who does not, you know, in order to be able to go to court and say, I have an enforceable claim, you have to be an eligible rights bearer. You have to be, be have to have a, an interest that has been recognized as a right. And if you don't, you can't even, you know, bring a claim. Um, you can think about burden of proof. You can think about many, many different ways in which sort of different rules play together to um, to advantage some players over others. And, and that could be changed. I would have to say also that has been changed sometimes, and then it was rolled back. So this is not a you know silver bullet. You do it once and that's it. You have to have the stamina to go back to these principles and reinforce it and not fall for short-term political swings. And that's not you know it's to some extent of course impossible. If you have a democratic system, they can also change it, but they can also change it a lot. And I think too much through litigation and through negotiating with regulators so that that has to be um, dealt with somehow but but I think you know even if we continue to live in a system where we say we want to have individual or subjective types of rights um, uh, how to design them and how much power they give you that could be rethought um, so there's room here and then I think the the, the, the other one is um, decentralized access to the means of coercion that you know goes hand in hand with what I said before um, if you do think that there is room and a necessary space for people to organize their affairs with one another peacefully and legally, then they also must have access to the ability to enforce them. But then that raises questions about how you structure your court system, who is making these final decisions, do we have the best system right now with judges sitting there? Um, including judges in the common law system that first practiced for decades as attorneys and then became judges, you might have a particular socialization and mindset before they become judges. You know, that that's the kind of questions I'm asking. So there's, you know, I don't think there is a simple institutional fix that we could do, but I think you can see trends um, within the structures that we have that could be countered in ways that would make more, uh, um, would make for a more equitable and um, and and socially inclusive system that we currently have. The the thing that I you know that I, I don't think one can solve in, at a very fundamental level is sort of the dynamic change over time, because you know things change daily, and through every transaction you can push the envelope time and again. And so um, I think we need some probably more radical measures. Um, and and one of the targets in my thinking are is corporate power. Um, you know, the idea that corporations can claim most of the human rights that you and I have, I think, strikes me as deeply problematic. 
Um, and so just sort of having just a very limited set of rights for corporations and limit to that and not more um, would be an, another another way to, to think about reconfiguring the system that we have. What do you make of the sort of more radical Marxist traditions and things? Well, I think, you know, um, you know, in that sense, I might be more of a realist than, than anything else. I just, you know, first of all, I think, um, uh, as I said before, complex societies need some organization of violence, some institutionalization, and some ways also to um, uh, use coercive powers to maintain internal peace and external peace. I don't, I, I just don't think it works otherwise. Maybe it's, I have a very negative idea of the human <laughs> species, but that's, that's, I think, what history has told us. So we need to have some kind of organizational forms and um, uh, even if you don't call it law or the state or something, something of that nature is needed. So it's not going to wither away. So that Marxist utopia, I think we can lay to rest. And then the question is, what else out there? And I think, um, uh, you know, one of the major uh, um, challenges that humanity is facing is whether this planet will um, remain um, open to humans to, to live on it, right, in the future, whether it's habitable by us, uh, given the climate change that we, in part, have, have um, helped uh, create and that is becoming ever more scary. So I think there's a binding constraint here. I think that is currently more urgent to solve than, you know, the idea of creating some kind of Marxist utopia in the future. And that will require probably um, a lot more force and imposition than um, than uh, like a, a, a communist utopia would, because it, it, it will require not just living by one's own means and contributing whatever you, you, you can to the community, but it will also mean restricting people from the use of certain resources in, in certain ways. It, will remain reallocation of resources to ensure the survival of many. It will remain, you know, lo lots of these things. And that's, you know, I'm not going to um, go deep into this in, in the current book, but I think that's really um, a deep dilemma for the legal system, including our democracies and constitutional systems that we have, how to deal with these challenges in an in a effective uh, way that is not utterly undemocratic and unconstitutional. Yeah, I think when you're thinking about conceptual foundations in economics, it's really important to not have to feel like you have to identify with one camp. Um, I think they all contribute interesting things, and the deeper you get, you seem more confused, and, and you should be reaching to all sorts of different perspectives for for clarity. So, yeah, it's it's, it's important to not have to feel like you have to identify with and, and stick to one camp. Yes, I have always resisted the pigeonholing um, and... Um, I don't know, it might make for a more lonely um, life as an academic, but it gives you also a bit more autonomy. Um, I, you know, I, I like to look at sort of the the theories that are out there and see how they work in practice. I'm, I'm not so interested in what crits very often do in the legal tradition or social theories is um, try to identify the specific um, position that somebody comes from and then extrapolate from there what their position must be or is. I um, tend to take people at their word or the written word or the spoken word and try to understand what they're saying and um, and then see whether it helps me explain what I want to explain and then take it take it uh, from there. R relatedly, how do you think about questions of personal responsibility? Uh, I know you talk about this in the Code of Capital, the the masters of the code. Um, but what do you what do you make of questions about attaching personal responsibility to to practitioners, to people who, who have a very personal role in the uh, facilitation of these things that we're talking about, we've been talking about, and they might be perceived to be malicious. And, uh... So I think, you know, this applies, of course, also to academics, not only to practitioners, but one of the purposes that I, you know, that for me, at least, the Code of Capital had was to tell also lawyers, including my students and my former students who are in practice, that lawyers have agency, right? Um, lawyers very often like to portray themselves as in the package, being in the packaging industry. They only make sure that what their clients want to do is done in a way that is legal, right? Um, so they're advising them on the legality of their strategies and helping them to redevise if necessary. But in truth, you know, lawyers would not be able to charge the amounts of monies that they do if they weren't creating value well beyond just simple compliance. Um, they they do design new instruments. They create new types of financial intermediaries that can take advantage of exceptions that you can find in some old 
statutes, the Investment Act or something. So they're they're constantly trying to use the law as a as a not only you know as a defense thing. You can't you can't do this. You can't do this. This is not compliant. But but really creatively to create something new. If you do this and you earn the amount of money that you do with that, you also are co-responsible with your clients to the outcomes that you produce. And I know, of course, that my students who make it into their first law firm job have little say over that. They have to, first of all, pay back our student loans. Second of all, they have to uh, make a career. And so they have to recruit clients. So they're compromised in what they can do. But even within those constraints, they're privileged enough, I think, that they also can make choices. And at some point, they have to decide whether they take this case or don't take this case, whether they stay in this firm or go to another firm, or whether they build their own and do the kind of lawyering that they are, that are is compliant with their own morals. And you have to ask that question at some point. And, you know, so so with, with um, acad academics, I, I think we had a big fallout, of course, after the global financial crisis with academics that had given advice um, without fully informing themselves or... Um, or by falling to the traps of their models without really looking at, at the evidence and, and lending credibility to st strategies that were non-credible <laughs> and actually caused disaster and were earning big fees for that. That's something you know we have to consider as well. Um, and apart from the fact that we are of course in very privileged positions that we can you know can do and talk and teach what we want by and large. And uh, but I think we also have a responsibility to the to the public. Um, even if we work for private universities as academics, especially in times like this, where there are so many questions by so many people about um, how to how to you know how to go about the world, how to make sure that we can protect our democracies, our legal system, the rule of law, you name it, and 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 deal with climate change. Sh shifting gears a little bit, uh, what do you think about the digital code? Uh, so thinking about technology changes and how they might be affecting. Um, the theoretical framework that we've laid out here. Yeah, so I have a I, I have a little discussion of digital coding in the Code of Capital because at some point I felt I had to address the question whether there might be a new code that might take over from the legal code, right? So many um, aspects of our life are now, um, I wouldn't say now coded in digits, not in law, because many of the relations, of course, also have a legal underpinning whether the digital coders know it or not. I think they're just finding out because the Securities Exchange Commission or the banking regulators are telling them what you're doing actually is a security. You're creating one, and so you're subject to regulation. You can't just say, I'm doing it in digits, that's just the form, but the substance f falls within our parameter. So there's, um, but nonetheless, I think you, you could imagine that, um, you know, we can create more and more uh, economic and social relations in digits in ways that the code determines the outcome more than the law. And one example are smart contracts, of course, where, you know, you pay first, even if you get a defective good, and then you can ask questions later, right? You can't use the non-payment, like the counterparty, to to block it. So smart contracts is actually, I think, an, also a misleading term for um, bonding customers to the terms of the supplier, essentially, you know, the, 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 the producers. But but that's a, a sort of a new technology. So I think we have to come to terms with that. Um, I'm also working on another project with a colleague who is um, a computer scientist and economist, and we are um, thinking about the the power, the social power also that comes with control over data, and how to counter that power. Because um, to us, this is um, this is also incredibly threatening for um, our existing social systems, undermining democracy. Um, um, undermining also um, the rule of law, undermining the ability for individuals to to exercise something that resembles free choice that might not even exist. We have had long philosophical debates about this, but even the the um, the appearance of you know making your own own important life choices is up for grabs once you can you're exposed to the kind of manipulation that we all um, are on a on a daily basis. So. So we are we are we are we are sort of playing with these different ideas. Um, the goal is that eventually we also write a book, but I have to finish my current one first, and then we move on to this one. So you are fearful about the centralization of power in information technology companies that might be undermining the, some of the powers of, of states and and social systems. Yes, I mean, like, in, in, you know, others have you know worked on this centralization issue already, including my colleague uh, Tim Wu. Um, uh, so I think uh, that has been a, a 
a recurrent phenomenon with new technologies, the sort of the centralization of power, then very often also technologies can erode the centralization of power and can decentralize, right? In a, but very often you are going through these waves. Again, the decentralization is never fully achieved for good, but it will be challenged again. But I think the um, what is, to me at least, new with the current um, uh, uh, concentration of power is, is this, the material that is being controlled, which is us, right? I mean, so the, it's, it's as, as, as social beings. It's not so much really about each individual, but it's us as social beings and our social relations with others, which are being used to code and, and, and to extract monetary value from, right? And I think here also the legal system itself is to blame because, um, you know, courts simply waived um, on when when sh when challenged by consumers like you and me whether those data that we produce shouldn't be ours. And the U.S. courts took the line by and large of saying that if these data that you produce that I produce right now by speaking to you have no monetary value for myself, I can't sell them. You can, you can get only a fraction of a penny for it. It makes no sense to sell it, right? And because they don't have monetary value, they're not property rights, which tells you the extent to which we have associated property rights with economic value, which why should we? We don't have to, right? And um, and thereby have basically created this gray zone where it seems like these data are up for grabs. They're like wild animals under Roman law, which can be appropriated and are appropriate by shooting them, right? You catch them. You catch an animal, it's yours, even if, if before it was a wild animal. So so actually there is ownership over the data, but it's not ours, but it's the big tech companies. And that seems to be upside down. Um, uh, but I think there's, there, you know, there's some hope because the good news is that this type of data, it's enormously powerful if you can catch it. And if you catch it in long periods of time, you can sell it to others. They can use it to manipulate us, et cetera. But we also know that 90% of all the data that has been stored today has been collected over the last three years, right? And that has been true for quite some time. So that means that if we can stop that concentration of data collection, then we can also erode, at least put a dent into the kind of power structures that are currently being created. So that the fluidity of the data, that's different from, you know, if you amass massive amounts of land and you fence this or you have corporations and you own them, you have really power for the long term. The, the data are a bit more ephemeral. And I think that gives me some hope that one could do about something about it. Right. So the details might be unclear right now, but uh, thematically, it's very important for us to think about our own ownership of our over our own data. Yeah, ownership or, or some kind of control and how to also, you know, um, make our own commitments not to share them for any purpose credible. And there is now the, the good news also, I think, you know, I'm not the, I'm not the technologist in this team, so it's also why I co-author. Um, but I, it seems to be that the frontiers in technology are shifting such that there might be cheaper, easily accessible and usable uh, technology out there where we can, you know, make our own commitments that we take with us whatever platform we enter. And we will not budge and say, my medical data might go to particular forms of public research in diseases, but they will not go to the pharmacies and certainly not to my, my employer, right? That kind of decision I would like to make myself. Right. So so it's, it seems like the design of systems, and I, I know I'm really speculating here, so so forgive me, but uh, it, it seems like the design of new information technology systems um, seems to be seems to be the place where we can do a lot of theorizing here. Yes. Yeah, the design of technology, yes, I think it's a technological issue. But it's also a governance issue because you know um, uh, we have to think about who makes these decisions. So I'm just I'm not just hoping that some nice tech guys will come along and make the right decisions for us. I also want to make sure that we have some control. That's the lawyer in me says I don't trust the technology guys either. Yeah, sometimes this argument is brought up that we just need to increase technological literacy amongst people, like um, uh, just literacy and programming and things, uh, and that will that will that that will bring about some change, but. Uh, it just seems a little too optimistic to me. Like, if you, if you know anything about how complex software systems at scale are designed, then it doesn't seem that giving newer generations technological literacy will really make a dent. You know, this is the yeah, this is the standard argument we also have had in finance, right? Just finance literacy, um, like bring it into the grammar schools. Just tell students from the get-go how to read accounts. Now, first of all, who has the time to do this? 
Um, and second of all, you know, even with increasing financial literacy, which I think has been uh, incre uh, increased over the years, we still have a hugely concentrated financial system with power at the very top and very little everywhere. You can read as much as you want. You can disclose as much as you want. We still don't have access to the resources and you still don't really know what's happening. It's just too, 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 too complex and, and too concentrated. And so I think this is always, um, you know, transparency is, it's, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's never enough. It's just, it's, it's, it's a, um, an important condition for any kind of agency on the part of others, but it doesn't replace some other controlled rights that uh, must, must come, come along as well. And I think the same with um, digital. And of course, with the digital stuff, it's also, it, it's hard to know enough and to keep up with the pace of technological development to have, you know, we, we can't go to evening school all the time to be updated on the same level as the technological code as it's just not possible. Just as, you know, we also have to trust the lawyers and maybe we should not to some extent because we might want to make certain decisions when we elect a party and hope that they will realize a party program for what goes God knows what, a social security reform. But none of us, including myself, knows the details of the black letter law. That has to go into this to make sure it's robust, right? That's we have division of labor for a reason, and so disclosure is just a misnomer for you know waving away effective regulation. Yeah, well, it, it, it's like saying that understanding how grammatical rules work is is equivalent to understanding how novels are written, or understanding how predicate logic works is the equivalent to understanding of the some legal code. Or, um, there, there just is a marked difference between having some literacy in programming and understanding how some given software system is, is structured. Exactly. And we also know, of course, from the, all the disclosure, you know, consumer safety and finance. I mean, there's such an information overflow that we have no way, we have no way of managing that, right? People have calculated how much it would take us to just read the contract that we sign every day when we enter into a platform with. It's impossible. We, we know it's physically impossible, even if we had all the literacy in the world. It's just physically impossible. Right. Okay, final question. Um, you've been really great at being interdisciplinary across all these fields, law, finance, economics, sociology. Uh, do, do you have any advice to to young scholars who who are looking towards this and, and wondering how they can be more interdisciplinary? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's, unfortunately, it's still difficult, although my hope is that it's becoming a bit um, easier, at least on the edges. It depends on the discipline that you're in. I think economics is very orthodox. And um, I know from Columbia that, you know, you can't get a credit as an econ student unless there's an econ economics professor um, um, at the head of the classroom. So uh, different with the business schools, they can take law classes and get credit for it. But economists, it's, it's a different matter. And and so some of these structures, again, I think could be changed a little bit to make it easier. The, the, the problem is, of course, is that um, most disciplines, and perhaps with the exception of law, define themselves by their methodology. And so you have to master that and, and you, have to, you have to find a job. So you're constrained by that as well. So that's, you know, there's a strategic aspect of thinking about how do I build my career within a particular discipline. And, and then there's the other question is, um, how, do I can, how do I really want to approach important questions and do I have um, the right methodology to do so? And I think, you know, my strategy has always been if I don't, if I find out I don't have the methodology, I either try to find another one that I master and if I don't master it myself and I can't learn all the tools, find a co-author with whom you can do it, right? Um, but I think that for me, the key has always been to, to ask the questions I wanted to ask and to subordinate the methodology to the questions rather than the other way around. So what I very often see in highly specialized, very respectable fields is that the methodology or the data set or what have you, or the, the FAD, you know, we all do instrumental variables at a certain point in time, then that's all we do. And, and then you just have to design another instrumental variable, whether this is important or really part of your research agenda or not. And I think that's unfortunate. I think academia should be the place where we ask questions. And then you have to find solutions to these questions. And being a bit open-minded, I think um, any smart person will realize at some point whether the, the tools that your own subject offers you are sufficient. I mean, it was, wasn't hard for me to see at the outset that with the German legal education, I could not ask the question that I wanted to ask. Uh, so I studied a little bit of history, but it was clear to me at some point you have to go into the social sciences a bit more. And, um, and if you don't know the techniques, uh, the methodologies, you just find your co-authors. That's what I would say. Uh, just, you know, just... just 
you get through your PhD, do what you have to do, keep an open mind, you know, always look for the good questions and make sure that you, you know, you don't get distracted too much from them while you're building your career and then go back to them as soon as you can, which is when you have a job and so after you have tenure. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that really is the key. Uh, well, well, that seems like the, the best place as any to end it off. Um, do you have anything else that you would like to sound off on? No, I mean, I, um, other than saying that, you know, I, I really wish all the, the um, your uh, listeners and especially students and graduate students who want to go down into um, the academic path and uh, good luck and 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 I, and I hope you know that you can that you can do it because it's it's I think one of the most privileged jobs and one of the most fun jobs you can have. 